Great, thanks for coming. We've got a great turnout here. Um, <laughs> really, the mic's a little low, no? Uh, <laughs> it's you guys size. Sit, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for coming. Um, this is, uh, we have to thank Patagonia for hosting, it, hosting us at their amazing store. This is an awesome venue. So thank you, Patagonia. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> um, so this is organized under a group called the Bay Area Tropical Forest Network. Um, we do events. Um, every couple months usually, so we end up with six to eight a year, and we kind of uh, move between Stanford, Palo Alto area, San Francisco, and Berkeley, and we cover a lot of tropical forest issues. Tonight's a little different because we also have the ocean issue. Um, and so the events are free, and it's an opportunity to meet people and learn about interesting stuff. Um, and then Manga Bay, which is um, an organization I founded, which is a nonprofit environmental news service. Um, so we report on a lot of these issues. And so we have an initiative called Wild Tech, which is looking at how <coughs> conservation can better leverage technology. Um, and we actually had two events last week in Seattle. Um, we had a, an event on AI with Microsoft. And then we had another event um, that was a little bit broader, just looking at technology. Um, yeah, so without further ado, um, I'll introduce the speakers. Um, so we have Greg Azzer and Robin Martin. And they're both at the Carnegie uh, Airborne Observatory, which is um, under the Carnegie Institution. Um, but they're housed on the Stanford campus. Yep. <laughs> so, and we have um, party favors, uh, <laughs> limited supply. So we, there's a National Geographic and then um, this Revolve magazine, which has some features about um, Greg and Robin's work. So, um, yeah, thank yeah, you again for coming. and <laughs> Re Help us recycle. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, here you guys go. I think what we're doing, uh, yeah, I think what we're doing is about 10 minutes of Right, Just so to give some context, right? Right, so 10 minutes of context and then um, back and forth and then questions from the audience. Can you flip the, do the slides? Uh, I can't if or I say I can next. Do yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You we're, you'll know that we're getting done because Robin and I, what, we've been working together for 19 years, which we just figured out today, and we've never given a talk together. So <laughs> this is complete, you guys are absolutely the test, uh, the test uh, audience. But, um, we're going to switch, I think, three times Yeah. in some sort of weird we'll try way. Try not to trip over anything. I think we're going to talk about what motivates us for a second, and then we'll leave the rest to questions, and then we're going to talk about a little bit about what we've done with forests and then what we're doing with coral reefs today and how we're, we're expanding our program. I'll say right away that the coral reef expansion does not mean we're ending the forest work. We're just doubling our program, so that comes up a lot. This is, uh, this is um, an image that I think motivates a lot of us. The world is getting more fragmented, and that fragmentation is causing us to have to do more tactical conservation. And tactical conservation can be <laughs> geographically tactical or by species or by um, uh, ecoregion, however you want to look at it. But however you look at it, it's getting more tactical, and, and, and that's requiring new science and technology to keep up with that process because putting a big circle around a part of the planet these days doesn't really do a whole lot. So that's really the, the basis of our work, which is a lot about mapping. Um, yeah, one of the other things about our work is that we feel almost, uh, I think we work seven days a week, but it's not work, because um, we're, we feel like we gotta hurry up because we're going through what I think people understand as this uh, sixth extinction process now. It's not make-believe, it's not hyperbole, it's real. And so what our goal is, is to kind of help us get through the bottleneck so that we can literally seed the planet beyond us with more species that will then generate the future of biodiversity. That's how I think of it, at least, as a, as a biologist. Robin might have a completely different story. Um, I, we just wanted to say something about how we got started in a slide each. Um, this is my start, 1992, so I think that's 26 years ago. And uh, this is where I started on Molokai Island in the Hawaiian archipelago. And I was tasked by a very famous conservation person that nobody knows, Alan Holt, uh, Nature Conservancy, that's who I worked for. And I was put on this mountain to find rare and endangered species and also to find invasive species. And this is a cool slide because um, it shows our coral reef system there, and it's one of the biggest ones in Hawaii that's still virtually unknown to science. This massive area of deforestation and then this mountaintop of biodiversity survival. So that's, that propelled me to, let me just say that when we were tasked to do this, we failed miserably. We could not find the rare species easily, and we could not deal with the invasive species. So that drove me back to school and grad school 
and we'll show you what has become of that 26 years later. You want to tell them your stuff? <laughs> I'll tell you my story. I grew up on the East Coast, and the only place I wanted to go after being there was Boulder, Colorado. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I went and I studied biology, and there you get plants and animals. You have to study them both for a while. And then I realized that animals, you just spent most of your time running around trying to figure out where they were and not actually studying them. So I got into <laughs> plants, and I had really good fortune of getting a job as I was graduating at the National Center for Atmospheric Research studying CO2 emissions from soils. And so I went from soils to bigger landscapes and then on to remote sensing and how I could use remote sensing through plants to figure out at the landscape scale what was going on. So. I guess I, I credit my start to NCAR and for all you females out there, a woman scientist who hired me to her lab. So. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, she's a year younger than me. So, uh, next. Um, fast forward 26 years and hit it again, I think. That's what we have today. Um, one of our key features of our program is this thing called the Carnegie Airborne Observatory. It's not just an airplane. But uh, it's also a laboratory on board, extremely high tech, instrumentation that doesn't exist at all in orbit today by any source. Um, it allows us to do things uh, in terms of mapping ecosystems in a way that are, is unique. And our program focuses on the application of these technologies that I'm skipping over for now, uh, on actual th issues that really need attention today. Um, this is what it's like if you are about to die falling off out of the plane. Uh, this is from one of our wing cams. Um, it's uh, just a GoPro on the wing, just to, to reference where we are. This one happens to be over the Ecuadorian Amazon. Next. Uh, some of the stuff we do, just in pictures, is uh, early on in the program. And I should say we started this program in 2005. It wasn't always this slick airplane. We started out with really basic aircraft and, and went through these things called twin otters and then ultimately to this high tech system. And we, we map uh, the 3D structure of forests. This was captured in a National Geographic article some years ago. And from that we can understand how much carbon is stored in these trees. And the red is tall forests with lots of carbon. Yellow is uh, shorter forests that are degraded from logging. And blue is of course deforested areas. So that's just an example. And we've applied this all over the planet to lots of different uh, countries and states, Hawaii, Peru, Panama, Madagascar, Southeast Asia, and so forth, and even um, part of a major global project. So that's been one of the applications. Another one is looking at animal habitat in 3D. Uh, we've, done, uh, we've worked on pr a lot of different species from Africa, lions, elephants, wild dog, you name it. Uh, and trying to combine uh, GPS telemetry. This is uh, us putting collars on these animals and then next, trying to figure out how they're utilizing a very complex landscape like this. This is the African savanna in Kruger National Park. And that was an application where we were trying to understand how the lions were utilizing the landscape relative to the fire management they were doing. And you, I can answer, answer questions about that later as well. Next. Uh, today, we have people in this audience and, and all around in our lab that are working in Southeast Asia on, for example, orangutan and elephant use of these forests in Borneo and in Indonesia in areas that are uh, diminishing in size and we want to know just how they're using that landscape so that we can understand where to place new protections and in this case, we're working with the Malaysian government to establish a new national park. Next. Uh, that's us flying over part of the Bornean jungle. One of the things, I'm going to turn this over to Robin now, one of the things that we started in 2006, mm -hmm. I guess, was the desire to map biodiversity of trees from the air. And people thought we were crazy. NASA defunded me. Um, it was the MacArthur Foundation and the Moore Foundation that picked us up. They were willing to take more risk. And uh, we went after trying to map the species in a forest. Most forests don't give you this at any time of the year. These are four species in this Appalachian forest, four canopy species. Most forests don't give you that chance to see what's out there. So we wanted to be able to fly over and map the different tree species. And that's where Robin 
should pick up. So we were thinking about species and rather than start in the four species zone, we decided we start in tropical forests because we were thinking about them in terms of, you know, you could, species have signatures in them of their chemistry and their leaves and how they grow and that's related to their evolution so we were thinking well we want to understand their true signatures so that we can tell their species apart rather than just a blanket of green and so we set up upon this project and here's a better illustration of what I'm trying to talk about. So you, how do you get from green that you might see from an airplane to forest to what's in their leaves or vice versa because people study things that way or that way and I'm trying to sort of bridge that gap between real understanding of the function of the trees to a landscape level uh, understanding of the species across the planet and here's what I was talking about you could early on people would measure because of <coughs> limited uh, ability to measure chemistry in leaves we would measure say two chemis chemicals and you get say your initials but if you have the signature of all many chemicals you can begin to separate the species even from so we can measure these from these chemicals from the air and if you look at these two leaves they look pretty similar to your eye but they're actually two different species and what's circled you can see that they have definitely different signatures and that's what we're picking up from the air so that helps us to map exactly what we're flying over rather than this bed of green that you might get from a satellite or when you're looking up at the trees you just see green leaves. To do this we took on <laughs> a ridiculous amount of work I would say <laughs> over a few years. Um, we have, so this is one of our tree climbers in Peru who climbs up to what 20 meters 40. and then 40 meters and then has a 10 meter pole that he reaches out to get the trees from the top of the canopy so that we are actually measuring the same chemistry that we're flying over bring them down then there's a variety of techniques to actually measure them right on the ground and then also to get them back to a field lab then we bring them back to Stanford do the regular chemical analysis with all the fancy machines, keep everything archived, and then we have an online database that we've also made of all these species. And the point being that we use these sort of hidden chemical signatures to link the biodiversity to the remote sensing so that then we can map the species at a landscape scale. And you get this, which is no longer just the four species. The, each color is an individual different species. Cool. <laughs> so once Robin figured that out. <laughs> by the way, she has half of all tree species on Earth in her archive here. Kind of cool. Um, she always forgets to say that, but I'm kind of proud of her. Um, hit the button. And uh, once we figured that out, we figured out ways to apply it in a conservation context, which is where I come back in. Um, hit it again once, and I think it'll play a little animation. You know, Peru looks like that in Google Earth, but really it's that in terms of communities of trees, where each tree, each color is a different community type of trees. A different, literally a different part of the, the, the community, the different makeup of tree species. And then these different views of it you're seeing are areas that are protected versus not protected. And then we were able to do a, a, an analysis of where are the national parks and other protected areas and how much of the biodiversity of 
the Western Amazon is being protected in these parks. And that, that was the first ever of its kind, and that's 2017 science. So that's brand new. So that was a big one, and that's all based on Robin's discoveries with spectronomics. Um, we, we decided more recently, or this really overlaps over the, three years ago about, we um, decided to start a coral reef program as well. And if you hit the button, I'll explain why. One of the reasons that we didn't have a coral reef program is that it's really hard to see through seawater. And so this is a diagram of a lot of physics in a, in a simple cartoon. And what we had to do was solve all of these arrows as we're flying over at about 80 meters per second flight speed. And we did crazy stuff like put <laughs> targets on the seafloor. This is uh, stuff that Robin and I bought at Home Depot. And uh, we did pick it up at the end. We recycled it. It's OK. And uh, we flew over and flew over and flew over until we could solve all of the physics of this and get the seawater out of the data, literally peel it back digitally. Next. Um, that, all, that effort was propelled for me personally by this event. Uh, 2015 was when Hawaii woke up to coral bleaching. Um, I've been there 32 years, and we haven't had a bleaching event really until 2015. This happened, and it started like this, and it got to be like that, and it got to be like that. These are photos I was taking while it was happening, and it got to be like that. Hold on, hold there for a second. Let me go back. Up, yeah. Yeah. And that's when I said, okay, we got to figure this out. Nobody, no satellites can see this stuff. No aircraft were seeing this stuff. Nobody's able to do this except divers. And I don't know if you, about you, but I have a lot of diving experience, and you just can't really see much of a reef, even if you dive every day at 365. So um, we, we decided to use those physics and use the Airborne Observatory, and we cracked this case next, using that crazy big gold sensor in the back of the plane, which can see through the seawater and solve those physics physical arrows that I showed. Next. And one of the outcomes, which is sad, but it's the first of its kind ever, is a clear view of what we lost in Hawaii. This is along the, the uh, west coast of the Big Island where we have a lot of experience. Red is where corals died. Cyan is where corals persisted, and green is sand, sandy bottom, naturally sandy bottom. So you see the loss. And we've been reflying to look for regrowth, and I'm happy to say that we're seeing regrowth. So uh, there is hope, even in a place that doesn't normally experience <coughs> bleaching because it's far enough north and in cool enough water that it's not really a hasn't been a problem until more recent years. Next, uh, more work is going on now. I'm going to turn it over to Robin for the last part. I think uh, we're doing really low altitude flights. If you want to get really sick. Come on board, and these are these are uh, 400 meter above sea level flights at wicked fast speeds. This is slowed down, um, yeah. And uh, we're collecting data at four centimeter resolution, so that we can see individual corals and even the the, the sub coral, the, the branching of the corals, to look for bleaching, to look for resistance to bleaching. Because what has turned the CAO on in corals is this idea, this need to find the refugia. Where are the survivors? And to do that, that's taken a whole nother um, process that Robin leads. This is the end, I think. Yep. So <laughs> this, those are really high resolution maps of coral. And then we go down and similar to the forest, use what we learned there, very detailed and um, lots of experience and put it into coral research. So looking at them in the water, taking samples, bringing those back to the lab, and starting to analyze the chemistry there to try and understand what within the coral symbiont, within the coral polyp is changing, or is it the polyp itself? And we have made, we're making a lot of progress there. Um, there's some really neat findings that we've just had, and there's still a lot to learn, but we are well on our way on that, on the progress on that. So um, that's the end, but um, we just launched this website today. 
and I'm marketing my new t-shirt. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, but everybody gets something, because you've got to have something. Brett, because you've been so kind of, so you get another. Thank you very much. And then we have stickers for, uh, for everybody. <laughs> but uh, the, Reefscape, the Reefscape project, please, um, is you're going to see more and more of it. Uh, it's a combination, as the logo shows, of a huge amount of field program. We're now funded by Paul Allen and Leo DiCaprio Foundation. Um, and we're, we're doing field aircraft and satellite-based work to try to advance quickly our ability to find these corals and find refugia and to pro propel conservation in this, in this domain like we have in forests. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That was uh, pretty cool stuff, right? So we're gonna, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask a few questions of them, and then we're gonna open up to the floor so the, everyone can get involved. Do you, um, you make me a studio? Well, we're gonna turn off the projector. Yeah, yeah we can't, we can't um, look at that on here. Yeah. So and maybe turn on some lights in the front. That was our first uh, combo talk. Was it okay? Yeah. <laughs> it took us. Two decades. It's because I seriously do not like speaking, and you can't tell. He's very good at it. So. All right, well, let's see how the audio works. Um, yeah, I mean, so I want to start first with kind of a big reveal. That may not be. Uh -oh. <laughs> They're actually married, and so I'm kind of curious um, on the dynamics in the field, um, you know, how that works. <laughs> 99% love. <laughs> I guess I, I was thinking about this earlier, and I I would not hesitate at all. If you want to work with your spouse, go for it, but just make sure you go to some of the most ridiculous con conditions ever where you have to count on each other for your lives, and then you'll do just fine. <laughs> do, do it before you get married. Yeah. <laughs> like, for five years or so. Yes. <laughs> Were you together before you started working together? Or did work bring you together? Work brought us together. Yeah. We met through science. <laughs> and we've stayed through science. <laughs> the miracle of science. Yes. <laughs> um, so you guys have hinted at this a little bit, but I want to get a little, a little more into it. Um, so obviously this work can produce a lot of really great papers that Maybe not to make go read, but um, <laughs> what, what are some of the real world impacts of what you're doing here? I'll say my favorite one. In Borneo, we're really working with the Sabah government, that's a major state in the Malaysian part of Borneo, to help them decide where to put a new 700,000 hectare protected area. To me, that's I like that kind of idea because. It, require, it doesn't require, but it benefits from high-tech science in terms of carbon stocks and biodiversity. And so we're combining our carbon mapping capability, our tree mapping capability that Robin's propelled, and our work with the animals and the telemetry to figure out how do you actually put a, a protected area down that'll save the most biodiversity while also engaging with our partners who are dealing with um, indigenous rights, um, villages, and politics in general. And so to me, that's been, I think that's the future of our science, is being a, a cog in that bigger, that bigger process. And, and Saba, you also found the world's tallest tropical tree, right? <laughs> the tallest 50 trees, actually. So yeah, yeah, we did Who's find counting? it. <laughs> we did, yeah, one of the byproducts is, is that we, uh, we did find the, the tallest tree in the tropics. Yeah, it's kind of neat. How tall? 74.1 meters. Yeah. It's, not it's, as not a redwood, but. it's not as tall as a redwood, and uh, one of my grad students who's studying redwoods makes it very clear to me <laughs> that we are not the tallest tree, so, but tallest tropical tree. But you, Robin. I think that's a hugely important part. The other thing I love about our science as a combination is that what I do in the lab and in the field can involve people from sort of I would say any discipline, but even not discipline, because I, people come to my lab and they start out with no experience at all. 
Um, I've had, what, a violin player and <laughs> a writer and, you know, a lot of them have worked through the lab and then gone on to science. The other really um, amazing thing for me is when we're working in different countries, we always have volunteers help us. And it's, we've had a group in Peru that have signed up multiple times and like found wherever we're going to come back to us and they're in college there studying science. So I, I feel like we bring both this conservation component as well as real hands-on science. So it's not just policy and talking and <laughs> we want to conserve this animal and whatnot. It's like, yeah, you have to get in there and do the work. It's very and tactical and so, pragmatic. Yeah. So what does a, uh, a mission actually look like? I mean, so if you're going to go map a new place, like, what do you have to do to do that? How long of an answer do you want? Short version. Put gas in the plane. <laughs> Put jet fuel in no, the plane. No, no, no. Get oh. permits and no. <laughs> she does, uh, yeah, I get to have the, you have easy part. the easier part. Yeah. He gets to fly around and talk to people. Yes. <laughs> it's, a lot of, it's a lot of work, but it's also really fun. And again, you're start, you communicate with a ton of different people and starting from approaching or now mostly people approaching us saying can we can you help us do this which is really the first reward and of course we're like yes let's go um, it's hard it's hard because a lot of there's a lot of need. yeah there's yeah. a lot of and we're not answering your question because it's a long answer <laughs> but but yeah you just steps. start from there and then work through a lot of different hoops and also also i should say that i've been through um my program, the CAO program, has had many people come through and graduate and go off. What we're at now is pilots and flight engineers and instrument technologists that are at the top of their game, the best pilots. And I don't say that like hyperbole. I really know when a pilot is a good pilot. And I found them in very distant places to pull them together. And that makes the program tick. Uh, we have people that served in the military doing all kinds of spy stuff that are kind of wanting to do something environmental now. We have all kinds, you know. Um, we have people that were bush pilots in the far north from Canada who can do amazing amounts of flying. Um, it's really the team that makes this possible. But we also it's have Marcelo back there who helped <laughs> get us into Ecuador. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it takes people it takes who really can make it happen. Cares, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned there's a lot of need. Yeah. Um, so how do, you, how do you scale this thing? I think there's, we're talking about multiple scales. So we're talking about how do we get 50 of these planes out there, but then also <laughs> looking <laughs> or do we need you know something in a satellite? So I think it'd be interesting to talk about like you know the scale scalability of this. So we're pursuing. So some of the technology can be put in orbit. When you do that, you have to um, you have to take some trade offs. When you get to those altitudes of 700 kilometers above the Earth's surface, their data are not going to be resolute like you see the individual trees. You just there's nothing that's going to get that in 3D today. Um, but you can do a lot still. So with satellites today, we're, we're developing new technologies with partners. Planet is one of the ones that I'm deeply embedded with. If anybody knows me at all, they know I'm down there half time, basically. Uh, that's, what's that? Up there. Up there, San yeah. <laughs> um, that, that's a company, and I don't mean to promote them, but that is a company that's extremely forward thinking and are trying everything they can. Um, and also keeping the government channel wide open in terms of NASA's program. It's just that today, NASA's program is pretty darn slow uh, for some obvi hopefully obvious, obvious reasons. So those are longer fuses, but any which way we can get this, the, the kind of uh, spectral technology into orbit is, is what's really what we're after. If we can do that, we can get the canopy biodiversity from, from Earth orbit at a, at a coarser resolution, but still very actionable for conservation, and also the coral uh, live coral mapping at, uh, at a coarser resolution, but again, very actionable. So that's where we are with that. I don't want any more airplanes, please. <laughs> um, they are a lot of work. So um, until then, we just keep finding the projects where we think the, effic the conservation efficacy is, is real, and that's how I select.
20% efficacy, meaning 80% of the corals that get outplanted die. Um, they're trying to figure out scientifically why they die so easily and also how they can game the, the reefscape to, to outplant them in better zones. And our mapping is being seen as a pathway for that. Um, what else? Then there's research. Tell them about the re there's some crazy research with assisted evolution. Yeah. Yep. So on a smaller scale, but fundamentally underlying that, it, there is work that I'm doing in the lab. The, in the corals, we've figured out, we believe in Kaneohe in the special place in Hawaii, in Hawaii um, that we can actually map resilient corals. So they've bleached in 2014 and 15. They've come back, they look exactly the same as corals that never bleach that are right next to them. We can see the difference in the spectroscopy and I've just figured out deep down into the functioning of the corals, which you probably don't want to really hear about what is the underlying mechanism for that. So that's coming out. Um, and then we're all, we've also started a project in Hawaii called Ridge to Reef, where we'll be looking at the whole ecosystem. So from the forest at the top all the way down into the corals and that will incorporate sort of land use change on the shore and how that's affecting the reef and how all of that gets integrated. Um, yeah. And what else? That's pretty much it. Yeah. Right In California, we're also still working on drought. Um, what about the global coral chemical spectral database? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> coral spec. So in the Dominican Republic, I've, we've sampled 50 different species and we're going to Australia where so we're similar to the spectronomics but now in corals uh, going to different regions of the world to collect up the different species there and look at their chemical properties to understand the diversity and then also um, look more in depth into certain species as to their resistance and resilience where we can find areas that that'll um, be feasible. So. That's all species on the planet. Yeah. That project is all Luckily all there are only on 800 planet. coral species, not hard coral, yeah. hard coral species, not uh, however many millions. There are way more tropical tree species than there are coral species. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to follow up a little bit on that, um, What's it like to go from looking at the leaf chemistry to the coral chemistry? I mean, it seems like you have to deal with a lot of other issues, <laughs> right? <laughs> hey, where's that? Wait, you have a, you have a problem? Oh, yeah. I brought, I brought show along a, a show and tell piece, my favorite new tool. <laughs> this is how I get a coral sample. I don't need that crazy tree climber. I just drill into it or hammer into it and pop. Underwater drills. Underwater drills, and then then you have to get everything out of that little piece of that little sample. So it goes back into the same sort of technical mess that you have in the lab, but essentially it's the same type of thing. You're dealing with an algae in that grows in the coral and the host that grows around it, and there are different properties of each that one wants to measure to understand why there are certain species in different places and why one might be able to survive hot water or light environments versus not. So it's there's a, a lot to learn. There's a lot to we learn. We know very little. And so you're, you're, you're looking at the hard corals, but is there other data that you pick up from the system? I mean, do, you know, I, I mean, soft corals and other types Flying of Flying or in the, in the water? It's flying. Um, we don't know. I, you know this, air, this, this coral mapping is absolutely where we were with tropical forests 15 years ago. It's, it, there's very little information out there. We're focusing on hard corals today, uh, meaning nowadays. Reef building. Re because of they are the reef builders. 
um, we see gorgonians and other things in the data. Mm -hmm. We see sea turtles in the data. We see and whales. Uh, we, whales. We, there's a lot of other stuff in the data, but we're really trying to figure out, kind of like trees being critical to having a tropical forest, hard corals being critical to having most coral reef systems, not all. But, uh, I, you know, I don't know the answer to a lot of this stuff. It's, it's just way back in, the, in steps and steps ahead of us uh, compared to the tropical forest work. So I want to give um, the audience plenty of time to ask questions, but I'll, I'll just ask one more, just bring it, bring it back home, really. So you, you did a mission in California, what, a couple of years ago during the height of the drought? Yep. What have you learned so far from that work? Uh, yeah, so um, what happened was uh, we got into year two of the mega drought, and so that would be 2015, I think. I got that, yeah, more or less. And um, state of California and the federal government were asking for input uh, as to what's really going on. Uh, meteorological drought is looking at the rainfall. They wanted to know what the biology was doing. And so Packard Foundation and CAL FIRE, which is the state big state agency, and National Park Service and Forest Service, we came together with us and we started mapping and remapping the entire state. And what we found was we were, uh, many steps later, we found two things. We, of course we can find the dead trees, that's, that's easy. Um, and we, the first year we mapped 68 million dead trees, um, but we figured out going ahead some years that the measurements we were making about the chemistry of the trees, live trees, we can predict a year ahead if they're going to die. And that's a postdoc in my lab, very brilliant postdoc in my lab that figured that out. So we can fly over a live tree and say, what's the probability of mortality based during drought? And uh, really accurately, 80 plus percent accuracy. Wow. And so that was the big, big game changer because it turned CAL FIRE from a reactive unit to a proactive unit. And when Jerry Brown did this, the, uh, what was it called, the um, State of Emergency for Dead and Dying Trees, that was us. That was us who made those maps that generated that. He profited. He got millions, <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government. We did fine too, we're doing our science, we're supporting them. But, um, but really they got what they needed to get out there and do fire breaks, fire management, prescribed fires, uh, infrastructural stuff of, around the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface stuff. They had thousands of, of staff and helicopters and aircraft. For us, it was also exciting because we're at McClellan Air Force, it's not an Air Force base anymore, it was McClellan Airfield. And we were flying out, and they would all be flying out in the C-130s and the helicopters. It was like an operation, and we were the ecology group. And that's what they called us on the radio. They, they were like, the ecology group. And so we'd fly around, and we'd direct them to where they could do um, their management. So that was that. And uh, the, the residual of that is we're doing follow-up studies now about our forests here in the Sierras have an inertia to them, driven by bark beetles, uh, dry trees, are get the sap dries up and the beetles get into the trees more easily into the cambium and those trees even if they even if it starts to rain and snow again they're so weakened that the system has continued to die a lot of it we're at 122 million trees died except in, except for the giant sequoias the giant sequoias yes which one was another <laughs> whole project yeah, that she led that we did yeah. with National Park Service, University of Berkeley. Um, University of California. University of California <laughs> at Berkeley. Yeah. University of Berkeley, whatever. Um, and really determined that you can, all the physiology, like the growth and the health of the tree is pretty much fine. What they do is they will just drop like half their needles and they don't care. The Those press really thought back. the sequoias were going to die. They I mean, when people are walking around, you, you look and you see this half brown tree, and you're like, Ugh! but they're fine. Very they're just few deaths. Yeah. Pulling in their energy, and they will. That's why they have been here for so, so, so long. And they'll that whole half will also go up in the fire and protect the other part. So it's yeah. So the sequoias are fine. But, but the news made big news yeah. out of the sequoias dying. But we and got they, money that to was do all, the research. That was all fake news. <laughs> so <laughs> it really was. Uh, that's how I call it, you know. But <laughs> call like you see it. What's that? Call it like you see it. Yeah. Well, it so, was. I wanna, so I want to open it up to questions from the yeah. audience. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think we don't need to uh, pass on a microphone. So if you're just loud. So. Hi, uh, my name is Clark. 
and I work with an NGO called Stockfish Bombing, and I'd like to suggest that a huge application of your technology for mapping is to detect live reef, dead reef. Yep. Oh, yeah. Now it turns out, you probably don't know, but we are also working with the Saba government, in particular parks, fishers, and tourism. Right. We have been involved in writing their Saba Blue Oceans Initiative policy. Awesome. Yes, and they've invited us twice to come down there. We've done demonstrations of real-time underwater detection of bombs that are exploding. We've pinpointed uh, people that are throwing the bombs, and for those that don't know in the audience, this is a tremendously bad problem. Estimates are that 90% of yeah. the reason the Philippines are destroyed and it's a very simple process. You just take a large beer bottle, you put fertilizer, you put ammonia, you throw it off a boat, boom. You take about 20% of the fish, the reefs are destroyed, and absolutely awful. And so our, we're dedicated to trying to fight this. Awesome. And um, listening to you guys talk today, I mean, we were in Saba, Mark and I, and this is my colleague, he's also a member of SFB. Yeah. Uh, we were in Malaysia when Dr. Pang announced the expansion of the marine protected areas in September and October of this year. And i got to tell you, the energy in that room was incredible. Everybody's so excited, I mean, the current election crisis aside, yeah. is so excited about moving forward with Blue Ocean Initiative, expanding the marine protected area, and also fighting fish bombing. So I would say that, guess, based on my guesswork, that if you came down to some of these areas, say Indonesia, Philippines, and you did some selected mappings of how many reefs are destroyed, you could bring a lot of these government officials out of denial. Yeah. And thereby bring about funding, which is the key element here. Yeah. So yeah. I think what you guys are doing is fantastic. I'm so impressed. I had no idea when I came here tonight what I was going to hear. <laughs> and, and I think that it's a slam dunk for you as you're going in your reef scape mapping project to also add dead reef, live reef. Yeah, and that's easy to map. Mm -hmm. yes. We're getting down to species now, so live corals and dead, dead algal cover corals, stuff like that, are easy. I did notice when I mapped northern, when I mapped land, Saba, I mapped the state of Saba, the yes. whole thing. We would come around the, the, the bend, so to speak, and I'd look out, and you can see the bombed out areas that you're referring to. So, so one of our partners in Saba is a video company that makes a lot of wildlife movies called Scuba Zoo. You guys ever Yes, yeah, very well. you got to dig them up. Simon Christopher is the founder of that. I know. I, and yeah, he has brought um, both Sylvia Earle and Jose Reyes Horta of East Timor to our team. And we're, we're getting um, in, into East Timor as well and also Indonesia. So it's, it's a really exciting time. If you guys want to talk about sharing um, ideas about Saba, we're all for it. So. Well, yeah. can I just... Uh, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, so this could be discussion after, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, let me just say that um, we're, we're thinking about uh, Australia, Southeast Asia deployment again. I don't have the money, but I'm hot on the trail. And once we get to that theater, we'll stay for, you know, six months or a year and get a lot of work done. So stay in touch, and if people are interested in that, we might go. Thanks. So yeah, it'll be our second trip to Southeast Asia. Great. Uh, so I have a question. Oh, sorry. I was going to add uh, the person behind you. You can go next. Okay. Go Hi. Uh, I was curious about something you mentioned uh, before about mapping the results from the tree diversity work that you were doing to uh, coverage by the national parks in Peru. Yeah. And I was wondering if you've been one, if you could say a little bit about what you found in terms of adequacy of coverage of protected areas, and mm -hmm. two, if you've seen trends as to what side of the spectrum that falls into both in the forestry work and in the reef mapping work. A lot of results from the project on that. Two that popped to my mind, um, and we've written all this stuff, so I could uh, surely get you those documents. But the two that are interest the most interesting are without indigenous lands, uh, I think it's Peru's national park system, and I, I misspoke, it's not just national park, but protected areas, including indigenous lands, if you consider them as such. Um, without, indigenous lands are basically responsible for more than half of the biodiversity protection in Peru. Yeah. Yep. Without them, the, the, the federal system, the federal park system is totally inadequate wow. in terms of the number of species it's protecting, tree species. The other thing that's interesting is Yaguas, this new park up on the Loreto, uh, Colombian border. That was, that was already in process, but our maps identified unique tree communities, communities there that were used specifically in that process of delineating that new park. So, there, you know, there's, the maps help people, even if they already know they're going to do something, it helps them make a stronger case for making a new protected area. That's kind of what that one that example was about. Those are two that popped in my mind. What else do you got? 
Um, that's similar. Also, there were nine community forest types that they had in Peru, or that they had mapped in Peru previously, and then our data showed them that they really have 36 distinct, that, forest, distinct communities. forest communities. So when you start to break things down at that finer level, you can then direct management even further. So like one of them was Brazil nut uh, forests, which are highly valued there, but they couldn't distinguish them from other forests. So, so things like that, that the higher resolution data helps them to see where, where that specificity is so they can target management that way. And then uh, in Saba, so taking that same sort of knowledge to Saba, which is a totally different political and sort of situation, um, they're, they're struggling there a lot with the communities and how to keep them in or out of parks and things. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that our, our Peru studies and our data can help them figure out how to integrate the communities into the management there. So, I was wondering, you guys monitor the uh, water chemistry over a period of years. We don't. Mm -mm. The reason I say this is over the past 50 years, we've gone from, we, we've manufactured now these very specific chemicals and very specific pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. that all get in the water. And I think that's a big problem that may be part of the cause of the reef sign off. Especially after going to the Malaysia this last year and getting in the water and feeling it, and it did not feel like regular water. You know, slippery, just yeah. you know, there were things that were wrong with it. Yeah, I don't know. We it, Technically, uh, this method that we've invented called, it's got a really uh, casual name, laser guided imaging spectroscopy. <laughs> it's something that you just use naturally. But uh, it doesn't, it, once things are waterborne like that, uh, we lose lock on the molecular composition of what's in that water column uh, mm -hmm. for a bunch of physics reasons. But um, I don't know of any technologies that will do that well. Surface, surface water chemistry, um, that's, that's a challenge area. The one thing that I know is that slick water feeling, we have it popping up in three bays in the Hawaiian Islands. Mm -hmm. And we know it's oxybenzone. Oh. It's, and if, you, if you've been tracking our work, we're very deeply involved in this, in this sunblock problem. Sunblock. Yeah, it's used in the, in the high-tech sunblocks mm -hmm. that you put on. And it's uh, 60 parts per trillion will kill corals. That's the same as a shot glass in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. It'll kill hard coral. And so we're very deeply involved in Hawaii with that. Um, we don't map the oxybenzone in the water, but we map the mortality of the corals. And it was pinpointed to three bays and then the, the chemists, the people that do that work at the University of Hawaii, measuring those chemicals found that the rates were wickedly elevated from the use of these new sun, sunblocks. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of sources of this stuff, industrial to, to tourism. But Hawaii just banned it. Hawaii did ban it, first state to ban some yep. uh, oxybenzone. Yeah. I have a more technical question. So um, when you're doing spectroscopy, what kind of frequency bands are you looking at? We were talking, so uh, you were mentioning you were talking to Planet and trying to scale this up. I imagine they're pretty much limited by the frequency <laughs> bands that they can look at, also uh, with the overhead times. Yep. So, oh, uh, a, what frequency bands are you looking at, and how much are you limited by the time of day when you're flying? How much is that, like when you're looking at an area in the evening, it must be very different than like... So you know your phone or a camera is yeah. a red, green, blue, right? Yeah. Uh, we're measuring in 427 channels, uh -huh. uh, and we don't look at frequency bands. The, what we do is something called photon counting spectroscopy, which doesn't exist anywhere outside of two instruments currently operating on the planet today. And that gives us this, instead of a band, uh, uh, bands and these bands, it gives us a signal across the spectrum, okay. and it's the waviness of that signal 
that tells us the concentrations of these chemicals quantitatively. Um, Planet is innovating forward in every way they can, and I don't want to say too much because I don't want to commit them to anything, but um, <laughs> the work we do inside Planet is designing design ideas and then laboratory bench tests, and it's getting, we're trying to figure out if we can get small scale imagers to do some of what we do from our aircraft. It's gonna be, what's gonna happen in orbit is we're not gonna get the CAO in space straight out we're gonna get subset capabilities of the aircraft in space. For example, coral reefs, we don't need the full spectrum. We need a very clean, strong signal in part of that spectrum. And so that's a smaller imager and some trade-offs so you can kind of get rid of the, the Ferrari and get to something more efficient, you know? And um, that's, where the, that's where we're at in Planet right now. The answer is, I don't know. Um, but the engineers there are that forward-thinking crowd like that. I don't and, have to talk to them. Yeah, uh, okay. they, But the doves are really small, right? So they're small satellites that are like this, the body. I, yep. I imagine they will have a hard time fitting a new sensor. Yeah, just to be clear, so what, uh, what's your name? Andy. Andy's referring to the primary units that they put into orbit. There are 163 in orbit today. <clears throat> Those are these little guys this big. It's an iPhone in space. That's one, that's, they have much more in orbit than those things. So um, test beds that are in orbit, I just need to let them tell you. So, but there's a lot of innovation and there's stuff in orbit that's uh, tech demo, figuring out if something can be measured. And that's why I'm so engaged with them as a scientist, because that's right. gonna be a pathway forward for sure as the governments uh, don't keep up. And it's the like other SpaceX, thing that they're it's doing the same thing. That Planet's doing is by putting like sort of overloading with even these smaller satellites is so that you get repeat time so you don't have to wait forever yeah. and you can you know stitch together especially in the tropics where it's cloudy all yeah. the time you have yeah. every day you get an image rather than once a week that then gives you an image maybe once a month yeah. this high yeah. repeat time you start to get actual images of the ground which helps you look at change or if anything's happening and it's already propelling yeah. conservation for example with aka amazon conservation mm -hmm. association doing great work with looking for yeah. deforestation with even their basic dove systems you know yeah those are really dumb systems but they're beautifully dumb because they're every day yeah. so with the photo counting you're not as much limited by daytime transitions or uh, do you fly uh, at specific times um <laughs> we can see we can detect we can get signal at very low sun angle, mm -hmm. really low. Um, satellites can't do that. Yeah. But once you put something in orbit, you're pretty much going to be sun synchronous. So you're passing over the equator at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. every day. So that's really not the issue. Um, for us flying, we fly super early in the morning, and the systems have to be wickedly sensitive. And why are we flying early? Because it gets cloudy by 10. Yeah. So we're flying at se you know, 7 a.m. We're up and we're mapping. Also, that's true. That's, that's true too, although we have systems to compensate. But yeah, it's really the light that matters. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm sure this is mm, next on your wish list, but um, I wonder how far away you guys are from being able to detect different species from of corals. Um, we're doing, oh, huh. um, you do the Connie Owe. Um, <laughs> it's unbelievable what she did. I'll say the dumb one. We can fly over in the Caribbean and find elkhorns and staghorns, no problem. Um, those, those corals that not just in size, but they're unique from their no neighborhood, pop in the data. But how about the ge genetic variation? Yeah, so in Kaneohe... That's in Hawaii. In Hawaii, that we, I think I've talked about it a little before, but we've, we can tell apart. So this corals that have bleached two years ago and recovered of the same species that didn't bleach. So resistant and resilient corals look exactly the same. Yet from the spectrometer, they're different and we figured out chemically why they're different. And those, then you put that next to a different species and it's like the, the different species is over here and these little teeny genetic differences, genetic differences we can tell apart. So. That's 80% accuracy on genetic. Level. Yeah. So I once 
I get all the data from all the other species that we're starting to collect now. So we started with the, I guess the harder problem, but the one for the genetic and sort of assistant evolution part where we we do care how many species are out there, but right now it feels like the most pressing question is how to help keep alive or bring back the species that are dying off so badly. So that's what we started with, but I'm really excited about now getting the time to look at all the different species and then dive deeper into that sort of chemistry. So, but yeah, it's, it's going to be easier than the trees, I think. <laughs> easier? Cool. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, tropical trees are really hard. There's it's way too many. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. How deep can you see the corals from your ear? We, we, our deepest detection of live coral uh -huh. is 101 feet, okay. 30 meters plus. And it was such a big deal that I took the president of the Carnegie Institution on a trip to dive it. Yeah. And we dove down and he looked at it and he went, cool, and we went up. But, um, but, but our mapping, our, what, I, what I sign up to do is yeah. about to 50 feet normally. Okay. Okay. Kind of the operational yeah. coral mapping is to 50 feet. And that's, that idea is based on the idea that most of the bleaching events, most of the hot water events are at the, in those depths. So yeah. Does the, does the water have to be pretty clear? Yeah. yeah. If, if the water is you know, blanketed with sediment, mm -hmm. we have to come back the next day. And what we find, like I just came from the Caribbean, there are days when it's brown. Yeah. And we go, ah. And we fly, we just go back and wait a few days and come back and it'll clear out. Okay. And that, that's an issue for us. Okay. It's, a, it's an, a limitation for sure. Yeah. In the back. Hey, uh, really good presentation. That was, I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, kind of going to the macro scale of all this, um, clearly there's a lot of amazing findings that can directly affect conservation interventions all around the world, um, you know, in forests, and now increasingly so in coral um, habitats. I'm just wondering um, how knowledge sharing, um, if, how you how you communicate these findings to um, various entities that will be affecting conservation around the world. So, um, we we use Manga Bay. <laughs> because Can I get a free T-shirt. Rest so. the best. <laughs> um, no, I mean, yeah, we're. It's interesting because I'm. I I don't know. I. I'm a scientist, right? So we we try to insert ourselves in a larger process. And those processes are very contextual. What we did in, what we're doing in Saba is different than the Dominican Republic, is different than Peru, is different than Ecuador. They're all different. And we just try to be a, a, this source of detailed information. So going back to my first comment tonight, so that tactical, more tactical interventions can be considered. And um, I think minds are lighting up to that because this kind of blanket level policy stuff is not working. Um, let's just be clear, it's not working. So we got to be very tactical. We got to figure out where we can save things, where we're going to give up areas, what we're doing and uh, as we manage this planet. And we're at that leading edge of the science, but inserting in these different contexts is where it stands today. In terms of communicating, yeah, I mean, I talked to a lot of people and reporters and, um, and uh, policy people and, and bureaucrats and NGOs and all that stuff, but I don't